This call is being recorded. Welcome to your daily writing habit. If you are writing a book or thinking about it, or maybe you've started writing a book, but you need some help getting it done, you are in the right place. Good morning. I'm your host, Christine Whitmarsh. If you're looking for me online, look for Christine Inc. I-N-K, like that stuff we write with. Each day I'm sharing with you the writing habits I've learned over my 21 years as a ghostwriter, book coach, and author. I have found that three things in particular have a huge impact on your success as an author, and they can even turn someone who barely sees themselves as a writer into a published book author. Those three things are writing fundamentals, productivity, and mindset habits. And once again, good morning, everyone here today on Your Daily Writing Habit to talk about his newest memoir, which was born of the pandemic and the writing habits that facilitated the book's creation is author Tom Bentley. And here's more about Tom. Tom Bentley's newest book is a memoir of his teenage shoplifting business, Sticky Fingers, Confessions of a Marginally Repentant Shoplifter. He is the author of three novels, a short story collection, and a how-to book on finding your writer's voice. He's published hundreds of freelance pieces in newspapers, magazines, and online. If you're in the neighborhood, he would like you to pour him a Manhattan right at five. <laughs> See his other lurid confessions at Tom Bentley, B E N T L E Y dot com. Welcome, Tom. Very happy to be here, Christine. Thank you. Yeah. So, just for my audience, I discovered Tom in the week of September 11th issue of Jane Friedman's Amazing News Newsletter. Tom wrote an article called Persistence Pays the Weary Writer, and I'll put the link in the show notes. And reading the article, I was like fist pumping the air in agreement with so much of what Tom said that my cat actually kept looking at the ceiling to see if there was like anything he should be chasing. So, so today's interview is going to be me quoting a whole lot of things that for my regular listeners will probably sound very, very familiar. So Tom, let's start with your, your latest memoir, Sticky Fingers, Confessions of a Marginally Repentant Shoplifter. I love that you called shoplifting your first business success. <laughs> and I often talk about how memoirs, rather than biographies, are meant to be slices of a person's life, not the whole pie. So how did you land on this particular slice of your life? Well, in terms of being a bad child, um, I guess that instinct born in me, despite having parents of very, very upright natures, um, I was a kid who was, I'll, I'll be brief about this, I was addicted to candy when I was a child, and I mean, I would rather eat candy than breathe, so, uh, and I didn't have a lot of money as a young child and uh, to pay for the candy, so after being a person who collected bottles, turned in bottles for their compensation to get uh, pocket change, I decided to be much more direct to just steal the candy. And uh, my first effort at theft, I was caught at the local liquor store, which also had the greatest candy collection in my neighborhood. It was just a few blocks walk away. And um, they called my mother and humiliatingly, uh, I was brought back to confess in front of these people who loved me because I bought so much candy at that store. But then I done that. And um, that started a, a sense of degeneracy in me that just continued for a number of years. I started um, at at my Catholic high school, so it's obvious that their regulations um, didn't stick with me very well. Um, I first learned how to steal from a vending machine um, by twisting the knobs a certain way and getting uh, like winter green mints out of them. Um, and that, when I finally went to public school, I realized that um, I had the ability at that time, of course, there were no detection uh, uh, automations or detection cameras or the little tags, electronic tags that they have today. I realized that I could just put stuff under a coat in a store um, and bring it back to school and sell it like cassette tape players, which existed back then, and uh, eight-track eight tape, uh, tape players for the home, which were big console style, and, uh, and actually branched into records where I learned how to get the store labeled bags by buying something small and then return to the store and putting records inside the bag and then stapling them up with the receipts 
for which I bought something cheap much earlier. And uh, this went on for years. <laughs> I, I was caught um, when I got deeply into stealing liquor as a teenager. I was caught after I was a teenage, teenager when I was 19 and spent a few days in jail, which um, should have put me on the straight and narrow, but it took a little while longer. Anyway, so for years, I was um, stealing and selling goods in high school. I was a bad child. My parents didn't find out about it until years later <laughs> and were shocked. Um, and uh, I finally developed a sense of shame. Um, so that is part of the book, but most of the book is about not being shameful and doing <laughs> things things that were shameful. Interesting. So how did you land on on this? Like I said, as a as like a memoir. I mean, there's so many you know threads. I think we all have in our life stories that we could do you know individual memoirs about. So what was it? And you said you did it around the time of the pandemic, where you're like, you know what, this is this is the next memoir that I need to do. Well, the pandemic put, as it did for most of us, in a different state of mind. Um, I, I have been a writer for a very, very long time and, and writing and editing all kinds of different materials uh, from book level to articles. And uh, I was a little tired of that. And the pandemic set me back psychologically. As I say, I shared that sense with many. Um, and I just thought of something maybe since a, a sense of mortality was a portion of it but i don't want to get too heavy but i thought of something that would be more of a summary of a period of my life that was colorful to say the least and um and might be interesting to people who both uh, grew up when i did and parents of children who perhaps they don't want their children to become like that and maybe they get some cautionary sense out of that and it might even be interesting for the adolescents who um, are considering a life of crime, but perhaps might uh, start a lawn mowing business instead. So the um, the pandemic put me in the mind to write the book. I I stopped um, pitching as many articles. I I slowed down my copywriting business almost entirely because I was a marketing copywriter for um, a bunch of different, uh, mostly tech companies, but um, so I, I stopped doing that, and I, I decided to concentrate on the memoir, but only in small increments, so I felt it was manageable. Though I'd written books before, um, I wanted to still be able to do some, obviously, income-paying work as well as as write a book, so I decided to do it in, in quite small increments. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that about in in your article about incremental writing and you calling it a compound investment. And I thought that was a great way of of looking at the day to day writing habit that it takes to get a book done. And so, yeah, tell us about that, your writing schedule, how you kept at it, even in small increments day after day, especially I know a lot of first time authors that listen to the show here. They, they struggle in the area of consistency. Well, um, I think the central, maybe not the central, but. The, the galvanizing factor would be a mindset um, that you can do this and that that mindset is enhanced or spurred further by seeing progress no matter if it is indeed just one slice of bread rather than the whole sandwich so you um, I had since I had written books before a number of them I knew I could write a book length uh, whether it was nonfiction or fiction I knew I could write a book length manuscript um, but I, I, as I say, I was trying to continue doing some of my regular work and I decided, I think that book Atomic Habits influenced me a fair amount and it has some very good advice about how if you're going to start an exercise routine, don't go to the gym and work out two hours. You'll come home ruined and, you know, <laughs> you'll hit, hit the six pack of beer, not your six pack abs, but, um, <laughs> but go you know, maybe bring some uh, five or 10 pound weights to your house, lift them for five minutes a day, see that you could do that. Maybe in two weeks, you're going to lift them for 10 minutes a day. Um, and that seemed persuasive. And since I had written a book and I, I have a sense of book lengths for different things, um, I thought if I wrote a half hour a day 
at a very prescribed time. And I, I spent some time trying to determine when I am most productive. So I was aware from having written a number of other things. Uh, I seemed to have mid morning seemed like a very productive time for me. So I picked an arbitrary time, um, 10 AM, write for a half hour, just be there, uh, turn off all notifications for everything. Don't check any email or anything. And, um, clear the screen, just have your single text, whatever your text editor is, that's, that screen is your only screen. And um, write for a half an hour. Uh, and sometimes I would just write notes, although I had considerable notes built up for this memoir already. But um, sometimes I would just expand on notes. Other times I would write new sections, looking back at notes that prompted some new thoughts. But a half hour, and its doability, I think, is uh, a thing that, that makes its doability doable again the next day. And, it, um, and then the days work with each other. And a, a very reinforcing factor is seeing that you have the work done. Seeing, oh, I, I have written 1,300 words in two weeks. So that's 1,300 more words than I had two weeks ago. Um, and that uh, that sense of doability, um, the sense of recurrence, uh, sense of habit where if you're not writing at 10 a.m. on a work day, something's wrong, right? You've made a mistake. And just as essential, the sense that I missed a day, something happened. I was ill. Um, I had a doctor's appointment that kept me in traffic for hours. Um, when you do miss that day, you just simply begin again. 10 o'clock happens again the next day. So you're there ready. you got the screen up and you can type or you can sit there and say, I can't think of a thing to type about, but you're going to spend your half hour. I love that 10 o'clock happens the same the next day because that, that is, that's such a great lesson for people because they do think it's like, oh no, I, and then the mindset kicks and I failed as a writer because I missed one writing cave. And it's like, no, you, the thing about tomorrow is, is with every tomorrow we get a, we get a new shot. So I like that 10 o'clock, it's going to happen at the next day. And you also touched on, uh, touched on productivity and the, you know, more productivity tips in your article about how you write, I, so your writing office is a 1960s Airstream trailer with a with an iffy phone signal. That's where we're talking from right now. Oh, <laughs> That's we're in the airstream. Wow. <laughs> we're in the airstream. Yes, actually. You know what? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> router and my modem. So the signal should be stronger. That just happened yesterday. Okay. So this is a test. It's going well, and I, I mean, as soon as I read that, this picture of, you know, the 1960s Airstream is the office, I just thought of that famous photo of the author E.B. White writing in his, on his typewriter in his boathouse in Maine. <laughs> For some reason, I had that image. <laughs> yes, his boathouse, yeah, I've, I've looked at that online before. Um, yeah, but having a little, it's one of those Virginia Woolf things, a room of your own, um, having a, some kind of little isolated capsule like an Airstream is, I think is very helpful. I mean, people have made makeshift office, offices out of closets, and if they can do it, uh, more power to them. I'm lucky in that uh, we have this airstream on our property, and it doesn't move, but uh, I move in and out of. <laughs> That's good. And now, have you always approached writing like this, like creating these kind of distraction-free closets, or or did this happen through trial and error when you realized that the other ways didn't work, or yeah, this, this distraction-free zones, how did they come about in your career? More of a trial and error thing. Um, I have been freelance writing for a long time, probably 30 years. And uh, there was a period where I was back in an office for a short while in the mid-2000s. Um, I had an interesting job copywriting for a, a villa rental service in Los Cabos. So I got to stay in many villas for free. But... Um, Mostly, I have been in an office in my home. Um, luckily, I started telecommuting in the mid-90s. My boss there at a, a software company for which I was writing user manuals was convinced the people that 
I would be just as productive writing from home because I wanted to move to Santa Cruz from the Bay Area. And um, I was a very early remote worker. Uh, there, were no, there was no one at this company that had ever done that before. Uh, but I, I did not have an office then when I first came here. I was living with my girlfriend and, and uh, it was a, just a studio apartment. So I was working out of the kitchen at a, an improvised desk setup. But that worked for a while. We, we moved into a different house, um, several houses since then that have been big enough to have a dedicated office. I've used the Airstream as a dedicated office for probably 12 years, um, although there was a refurbishing period a year ago that took longer than expected. So um, it, it's a definite enhancement to have the quiet and, and to simply have a place that is, this is my office. I, I, it could be slept in, it could be you know an Airbnb because it is, set up to do that. It's plumbed and everything, but it fundamentally is my office. And um, it has lent itself to a lot of imaginings. I mean, I, I'm kind of, I go into dreamland sometimes as, as a writer, as many writers do, and it's a good, nice place to go into dreamland. And I tried to take notes after dreamland. <laughs> That's really cool. So I understand you have a new work in progress now. Did I understand this correctly on your website? Is about a 30 plus year correspondence relationship with the Jack Daniels Distillery? Yeah, I have a yeah. <laughs> Is that a memoir? What? How, how does that work? <laughs> well, um, when I was in, in as an undergrad up in Sonoma County, up north of here, um, I well one I'll go back a little bit. Part of that memoir is about when I began stealing liquor as a kid, and um, I tried the worst <laughs> liquors imaginable um, because they were stealable. They were like half pint bottles, which are very easy to steal. Don't tell that to your children. But uh, anyway, well, they don't even have half pints exposed anymore because they're too easy to steal. But the um, I took many, 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 many bottles of liquor for me and my friends as high school kids and slightly older, trying everything um, and some truly wretched stuff, blueberry schnapps and things like that. Oh. Um, very artificially flavored death spirits. <laughs> but in the midst of that, I discovered that I just like whiskey. And uh, so years later, having gone to college, um, where I could actually buy whiskey and pay for it at the store like a, a normal human. Uh, I first bought Jack Daniels and they had a little invitation on, on their bottle. Please write us and tell us what you think about their, their spirits. And I wrote to the distillery and I said um, that Jack Daniels keeps me fortified for, you know, keeps me courageous during down times. I brush my teeth with it. I told them a bunch of things that were just balderdash. And uh, they wrote me back. And that was in the mid 70s. And they literally wrote me for 30 years. Very, very crazy thing. Very crazy. Um, I have a I have a deed to land there after I, I had written them back and forth many times. They granted me a deed to like an inch of land outside of the distillery. And it, I have an actual certificate. It looks like a proper land grant deed. Oh my goodness! Um, but they were, would write me and say, "Tom, we'd love to look for worms on your property. We'd love to dig for worms on your property." And I'd write them back and say, "Just be careful, but you know, I wish you best of luck with the worms for for fishing." They'd write me, "Tom, we want to run a metal detector over your property and see if there's any minerals there." And you know, we'll share the bounty with you. And they would send me a black and white snapshot photograph of of like a plate with a bent rusty nail on it and a bottle cap and said, Tom, this is all we could find. We're sorry. So I have I have a lot of those letters. And like I say, they're they're quite crazy. Tom, we're gonna put a, a traffic signal at the intersection, the only traffic signal in Lynchburg where the distillery is. Do you think we should do it or not? Uh, so, so the, it was, and I was, I was amused by what they sent me. So I'd write them back and I'd say ridiculous things back at them. And, uh, 
over the years, they sent me very crazy stuff, as well as the letters, you know, rabbit's foot. Uh, I have, right in my hand right now, I have the Tennessee rubbing stone they sent me. That, um, you know, it's just, you're supposed to rub it when you have anxiety. So I just, I have it out here in the trailer. Uh, they sent me chewing tobacco. They sent me an album of Appalachian folk songs. They sent me calendars every year. They sent me cookbooks. Um, so it's, it felt like memoir material, um, even though it, it's yeah. a longer time period than most memoirs. It's a concentrated thing, the correspondence between me and that distillery. And so I, I have written a proposal for it. I've, I've shopped it around some. It hasn't gotten anywhere. If it, um, I did send out another proposal uh, a week ago. If that doesn't come to fruit, I will likely self-publish. Um, I do have permission Please from do. distillery to use the material because um, they are. They, it is a copyright issue. If they sent me a letter, they own the copyright still. But um, so I, I'm thinking about doing that. I think it would be amusing. Yeah, I, I'm already amused. And you know, my <laughs> husband and I visited the distillery in Lynchburg several years ago. So I'm just laughing at this because you know I. I, I kind of picked up on the fact that they're a rather eccentric brand, but I really had no idea. I mean, you could tell by the tour. We did the whole tour with the waterfalls and all the things, and everybody right. seems very kind of, you know, whimsical and eccentric, but I, I had no idea. And I, now I wonder if we, we drove over the Tom Bentley deed of land, my husband and I, while we were there in Lynchburg I hope on not. traffic light. <laughs> I'd be offended if you drove over my land. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know which part of it. <laughs> It's out by the hollow, so it's not that far from the the um, little cave where the the waters go through. Oh yeah, um, okay. Maybe we we were in proximity of the Tom Bentley deed of of land then, because yeah. yes, I remember somewhere, the cave. It's somewhere near the statue of Jack. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was yeah. a great tour. I'm not a, I'm not a whiskey drinker, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed that tour. Yeah. Well. While I was on that tour, and this will go in the book for sure, and I don't know if they still bring you that, they they take you by the fermentation tanks, which are very large open tanks, yep. mm -hmm. bubbling yep. the, the yeast and the raw alcohol and grain. Well, yep. I was on a tour. We were circling around one of the fermentation tanks. Um, an old guy was taking us on the tour, a nice guy. Some other old older guy, and I was there years ago. I'm an old guy now. But some other old guy, when the tour guide was speaking, but not looking in his direction, just reached down, grabbed double handfuls, palmfuls of that raw liquor, which isn't liquor yet, oh, and no. drank it. <laughs> oh. He didn't do it once, he did it twice, so he liked it. Now that is, oh. it's a, you know, it's a vinegary, soury, fer fermenting, bubbling um, mass of, of, Soon to be whiskey, but very much not whiskey. So that was something. I remember the smell was just horrible. I mean, that was that part of the tour. I was like, oh, we need to keep. I just remember that smell just being very pungent in that room. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, an old sock smell. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. Wow. Well, that was, I can't. Yeah, please publish that book somehow. <laughs> I love your, you're just, you're, you're just following my theory of memoirs where it should, you know, it's not, you don't just write one memoir. I mean, I have a, a celebrity client who, you know, she did, you know, one memoir for Simon, Simon and Schuster and then Penguin called a few years later and they said, well, we want your memoir too. And she was confused and said, well, I already did one for a memoir. And they said, and the, the, the rep at Penguin literally laughed and said, you can do, you know, some people can do 10 in their lifetime, if not more, you don't just do one memoir. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm impressed Penguin called her, so that's nice. Yeah, no, that was really cool. So, um, so this is a question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. Uh, what is your very best success habit, whether it's writing or otherwise? Well, I, like many writers, and I do know some, um, you get that sense that there's no use. Sometimes uh, you you know you publish something and it goes nowhere or you submit something and it doesn't even get a chance to go nowhere. And uh, it's easy to listen to that self-talk that tells you, well, you're not, not a writer. You're not only not a writer, you're a failure. Um, so 
moving on from that, because I have that self-talk like many, many writers, moving on from that and seeing that that is just that self-talk, that's a little squirrel in your head who is not educated. It's just a reflex potion in your head. Um, and it's based on a number of things. Some of it is fear, fear of putting yourself out there, you know, fear of having someone look at your writing. And you have to climb back out of that hole. And so those holes happen, but there are ways to climb back out. And, you know, it's almost like what we were saying about uh, writing for a half hour at a time. One step at a time, climb out of the hole, climb out of the hole, get out of the hole, start writing again. So. Um, I will continue writing. I, I've had some dips and, and uh, driving into the ditch on the road with some writing, but um, but it is writing is is such a natural thing for me to do uh, that I can't imagine not doing it, and uh, I will continue. And it, despite you know that machine gun chatter in your head that it will often tell you your other than than your potentials, your potentials are still wide open. I mean, I still believe that even at this date in my life. Awesome. So that's I think that's one of the most unique answers to that question I've gotten on the show. Success habit is stop listening to the uneducated squirrel in your head and keep climbing out of the ditch over and over again. Love that. Yeah. Great success habit. Well, if everybody wants to follow. Tom and learn more about his work and order his, his recent memoir, Sticky Fingers, Confessions of a Marginally Repentant Shoplifter, Tom Bentley, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y.com. I'll put the link in the show notes. And thank you so much for being on the show today, Tom. This was really entertaining. Well, thank you. I'm happy that you were entertained. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased and, and I appreciate you asking. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank all of you listening for joining me here on Your Daily Writing Habit, where I am helping you write and finish writing, the operative word, an awesome book. Please drop by my Inc. Authors group on Facebook to connect with other authors like yourselves. Of course, that's in the show notes too. Until tomorrow, happy writing.